at some word pictures in scripture. Word pictures that are left for us to help us in understanding the nature of the church and what Christ intended for the church to be like. We've seen that uh, the reference to a boat and how the church has characteristics of that symbol, of unleavened bread, how we are to remain strong and firm with the truth and not allow the world to be influencing us. How we're the field of God in which, uh, in which God is doing the work. We also saw how we are the vine, uh, Jesus is the vine and we are branches connected to that vine intended to bear fruit. We saw that we're God's vineyard, that he left his vineyard in charge, uh, left some people in charge of his vineyard and that they abused that. And so he was going to find some new renters. We saw that we, the church is like an olive tree and we talked about some of the being grafted in and what it means to be grafted into the holiness of God. Uh, last time we talked about being the building of God and the fact that we need to be upon the foundation that was laid because Paul said there is no other foundation than Christ Jesus and so we need to build upon that foundation. We also saw that we need to be careful how we build. That we can uh, build with things that are more precious and valuable or we can spend our spiritual capital building with uh, uh, things that are of less significance and we need to be very careful how we build upon that foundation. This morning I want to continue down the wing of architecture in as we walk through this gallery of pictures and I want us to think about how we are building upon rock. Jesus made a promise that he was going to build upon rock. We saw that that foundation is Jesus but the concept of rock building is perhaps broader than just foundation and so we want to understand some things about the nature of the church because it can be built upon and is built upon rock. We begin with this passage in Matthew chapter 16, one that we're extremely familiar with, where Jesus says he's going to build his church. But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, you didn't get this figured out because of who I look like or what I look like or whose son I am. He says, rather, the Father who is in heaven has aided you in, in believing this. The evidence that has come from God has led you to believe that I am the Christ. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Interesting how Sam selected a song in which two verses we sang about were about the gates of Hades not prevailing against this kingdom that Jesus said, I'm going to build upon rock. I want us to notice three things this morning about uh, the kingdom of rock that Jesus was going to build. First of all, the text says that Jesus is building it. It's not something that humans built. It is something that the Son of God said he was going to build. The word that is used here in the Greek language for build is interesting because it initially identifies Jesus as the house builder or the one who constructs. I was curious just for my own meditating purposes. I wondered, could this have been why God gave Jesus his son to be in care of Joseph, a carpenter, who in all probability was not more of a mason than what you and I think of as a woodworker because mason rock would have been more what was used to build at this time so was that part of the preparation did jesus spend 30 years in the house of a carpenter so that when he got ready to build his church he knew what it was to build his church upon a rock you can meditate on that now some yourself the uh i called him in the 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 root word from which that comes is a compound word made up of, first of all, oidus, which is a dwelling, and, and it implies a, uh, a family, or more or less related. I've got some of those in my, in my family. How about you? You've got some of those that you're more or less related to. Uh, and then doma was the second part of the word, which means an edifice. Uh, specifically, it means a roof. So if we put all of that together, this first truth reveals that Jesus' intentions 
are that he's going to construct something that's going to be more or less family. And that in doing this, he's going to provide for them, if you will, a roof of covering, a protective edifice. And that's going to be the church. I'm going to build a place where those who are more or less related, obviously related in the blood of Christ, are going to be able to dwell in a, a, a group of people, dwell in a place. Jesus is the constructor, he is the maintainer, and he is the owner of what he builds. And folks, therein lies the reasoning for identifying ourselves as the church of Christ. We do not call ourselves that as a denominational title. It is not because, you know, that's uh, the selection that was made. We're not trying to uh, make ourselves distinct by that term. We are trying to show who we belong to. We belong to Jesus. We want to be the church that Jesus built. Now, there are other references in Scripture, other scriptural references to the church. It's called the way. It's called the church of uh, the firstborn, the church of God. There's other things it's called. But... All of those terms all identify who the builder is. And so we have selected, Romans chapter 16 and verse 16 is one where Paul says that the churches of Christ salute you. We find that in scripture, so we say, okay, we're trying to be the church that Jesus built. What do we want to call ourselves? Well, we want to call ourselves something that shows that Jesus is the constructor, that he's the maintainer, that he's the builder. So do we have to call ourselves Church Christ? I think that's maybe the wrong question. I think the question is, why would we not want to identify ourselves as the body that's seeking to honor the architect, the contractor, and the builder? Why would we want to call ourselves anything but what would honor the one who said, I'm going to build my church? Okay. Secondly, Jesus built it. And the second fact of the rock-solid truth is Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Love the book of Revelation because that's all it's about, is Jesus winning. And all of those word pictures in there just say Jesus wins. The phrase that Jesus utilized as he's discussing with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, he says, the gates of Hades will not be able to overpower what I'm going to build. The gates of of Hades. Jesus proclaimed that there was nothing in this world that would possess the power to be more than his church. Again, a compound word in the original language made up of adding down and force. What Jesus literally is saying is there's nothing that will be able to force down my church. Nothing will be able to force it down. It is being built by Jesus Jesus wins by building this. I'm not sure if this is going to work. I hope, I hope that it does. It was having some issues earlier. Uh, Ray uh, Vander, Vanderland engages in a discussion while at, literally, Caesarea Philippi, looking at the opening, the cave opening in a mountain that was identified, called, at his time of, of living, the gates of hell. This was a place where deities were worshipped. It was thought that Baal went down in the wintertime through the gates of hell and abode in the deep. And then in the springtime, he came back. So this was a place where they worshipped fertility, believing that this was Baal coming up and he was going to, by the water that was flowing out of this cave into the Jordan River, that this was going to be a means of fertility. Ray is going to talk about building on the rock. He's going to talk about Jesus winning. I've got about, uh, it's three minutes long if it works. Traditionally in the Protestant faith, we've said that the rock on which the church is built is Peter's confession. But I think if you understand the geography and you come here and appreciate what this place meant, you'll understand that there's an additional concept that Jesus has in mind. I think he was also saying, on this rock, meaning the rock where the gods are, the rock representing the paganism of his culture, the rock representing the fertility practices, the negative 
ungodly values of his culture, on this rock I will build my church. In other words, in a very confrontational way, saying, my church is going to come and take the place of the paganness of this. Now, you might say, well, that's kind of a neat image, but are you sure that's what Jesus is saying? Well, I'd like to have you think about the very next phrase in Matthew. He says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. In a sense, what was practiced here was the worship originally of the Canaanite god Baal, who every year went down to the underworld to a place called Hades, where he spent the winter, hopefully coming back to life in the spring. So in a sense, he's called Beelzebub. What is Beelzebub? Beelzebub is the lord of the underworld, the god of the dead, the god of hell. And Jesus even refers to Beelzebub, or Baal, as the devil. This could be thought of to be called the gates of hell. In fact, I found an interesting reference in the rabbinic sources which said when Messiah comes, the gates of Caesarea Philippi will collapse because of the wickedness and the paganness of that particular place. And Jesus may have even had that in the back of his mind. So he says the gates of hell will not stand against the church. Now I'd like to have you picture that image. The church, the church of Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. What's the image in your mind? Do you see the church as a huge fortress, towers and strength, and the devil pounding against the church, but never being successful? And I want you to listen to the image. He says, I will build my church on this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail or will not stand against it. And now, having studied the city gate at Gezer, having sat in the city gate at Lachish, going to the city gate of Tel Dan, in wartime, what do gates do? They defend. So if the gates of hell will not stand, who is attacking whom? Is the image of the church like a fort that is keeping the devil out? I would say that's absolutely backwards. The image that Jesus says is this, on this rock I will build my church, meaning his faith, his way, is going to replace the very power or religion or strength of the devil. And he goes on to say, and the gates of hell will not stand before the church. Jesus is saying to you and to me that our mission is take on, in culture, in society, the gates, that is, the very entrance, the very strength of hell itself, of the devil. I would suggest that our tradition as Christians has been to be very defensive. Traditionally in the pro That when Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail, that he was referencing, my church is offensive. My church wins. In earlier sessions of this series, Ray has discussed how these ancient gates had towers. And the purpose of the towers was you put soldiers in those towers, and if someone attacked your gates, they were in a confined place where the soldiers, all they had to do was to take them out. So the gate was the strength of the city. It was the defense. The defense of Satan breaks down because of the rock, solid truth of Jesus' church. Okay, Jesus wins. The last truth that I'm going to talk about from this text is that Jesus also secures. You see, it wasn't just about building a church. It wasn't just about the beginning of the church. Jesus is talking about my kingdom is going to be a rock place for all time. And I secure it as such. I build it as such. I win. And I secure this place, this place of strength. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show him whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on what? On the rock. And when the flood occurred and the torrents burst against the house, 
and could not shake it because it was built well. But the one who has heard and does not act accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation and the torrents burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of the house was great. Jesus said, I'm building my house, my church on a rock and that's going to enable it to stand. Stand. Jesus makes this a secure place. How does he do that? Well, it's secure because, first of all, <laughs> the builder is divine. The builder is deity. Again, we would notice Philippians chapter 2. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took an hum humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared to, in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal death on a cross. Jesus built it. He secures it because he is deity. It's also secure because he is an all-authoritative builder. There's nobody else who can add anything to it or take any away anything from it. He has the total authority over how this is built, and he told his disciples when he gathered with them before his ascension, and he said, I want you to go into all the world, and I want you to preach the gospel, and I want you to baptize people. Why? Because, he says, all authority has been given to me, both in heaven and on earth. I have it. I have all authority. This place is secure because it's built by an all-authoritative Jesus. It also is secure because he is an ever-protecting builder. He is an ever-protecting builder. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you, and that you will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. The Lord is faithful. And he's the one who protects those who are part of this rock-solid kingdom. He is all protective. Hebrews chapter 1 is another passage where the Hebrew writer talks about how there was a time when God spoke in all these different forms. He, taught, he spoke through prophets, and now he has spoken through his son Jesus Christ. And then he ends that by saying, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus upholds. He upholds the church by the word of his power. Jesus also secures the church because it, he is an always present builder. He's always present. He's always there. I love this little, uh, I, I, I was looking through and, and studying some passages, and this one just struck me from Revelation. Then I turned to see the voice, and this is John saying, he, he was in the, had this vision and he heard this voice, and he says, and I turned and I saw the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man. Where was Jesus? He was in the middle of the lampstands. Where is Jesus? He's in the middle of his kingdom. He's in the middle of his churches. He's ever present. He is with us. That's a rock-solid truth. The raw truths upon uh, which we can understand, Jesus is the builder, Jesus is the winner, and Jesus is the security for his church. Now those are some symbols that we can get a hold of. Those are some symbols that we can live with. One other picture before we leave this uh, section of the art gallery that I want to look at, and that is the support of God's truth. The church is the support of God's truth. First Timothy chapter 3, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, obviously a picture, a symbol of the church, and then he says, the pillar and support of the truth. So here we have a building phrase that we are, as a church, the pillar and the support of what is true. Pillars and buttresses are architectural structures that support. And I'm not a trained architect, 
So Duane will have to correct me if I'm just totally off of base. But the effectiveness of a pillar and of a buttress is based upon compression, not tension. Now, as one who's very naive, I read some websites and they helped me understand that the diagram on the left is illustrating something being supported via compression and the diagram of the chain is something that is having shape by tension. The chain is held and forms that shape. Pillars, buttresses, hold their shape because they are compressed. You say, well, so what? Well, here's how my brain went. God's word is a heavenly weight. And its truth compresses us. It compresses you. It is placed upon you. You do not have to obey God's word because of tension. God doesn't hang on to you so that you form the shape that he wants you to be. He gives his truth to us so we can be compressed by his truth and bear what we need to bear. Now that seems to be significant to me. That God's truth is a compressing truth, not a truth of tension. One website that I looked at discussed the reasons for failure of that kind of structural building. Now, obviously, materials could fail, but beyond material failure, there are only two reasons that this site said that there could be failure. One is when the structure cannot support the load. When the structure cannot support the load. And as you see in that diagram, the way and the means by which that would happen is if the stance is widened from those that are supposed to be supporting this load. If they move out, the structure will fail. If the support gets too wide, the arch will collapse. Now, again, as I thought about that and tried to relate that to spiritual truth, when the church decides we're going to broaden the way we understand truth, when we decide we're going to be more understanding and compassionate in a negative sense, uh, in the sense of tolerant of the world than we are of God's truth. When we widen that, what happens to the structure of the church that's supposed to be the support and the pillars of the truth? It collapses. It collapses. Now the second reason, oops, Hebrews chapter 12, for you've not come to a mountain that can, cannot be touched in a blazing fire and in darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sounds of the wor uh, words which sound uh, was such that those who heard begged that, n that no further word be spoken to them for they could not bear the command. This is about the people of Israel coming to Sinai versus us coming to the mountain of Zion now. We used that passage several weeks ago. But what I found interesting is that what could the people not do? They could not bear the command. Are we able to bear the commands? Not if we widen our stance. We won't be able to bear the commands. And the second reason that an arch fails is because uh, that it loses its shape. It gets twisted. It gets distorted. By the way, that's why these, these ancient arches exist because they have been compressed and they've stayed their stance and because they haven't been twisted and they've existed for centuries some of them for centuries and centuries because they have kept that but again as we seek to make a spiritual comparison when when supporters of God's truth get bent out of shape they lose their ability to be the undergirding for the truths of God Hence, last week, we looked at the fact that you know, we, we can invest spiritual capital in things that are just not significant. We can get bent out of shape over things that don't matter. And we need to be careful, because if we get bent out of shape, 
We can become anger, bitterness, malice, become uh, controlling factors. We don't forgive. And when those things happen, we get twisted. We can't support the compression of God's truth. Galatians chapter 5. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. We get twisted. The structure cannot stand. The nature of the church to be characterized by those who utilize all their ability to support God's truth with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. We are to be burdened, compressed by God's truth. We put ourselves under it. We say, I'm going to remain where I need to be. I'm not going to get twisted. I'm going to do what I need to do because I am the pillar and support of the truth of God. And also, we need to work to stay in adjustment with that truth. Okay, we've looked at the architectural wing of some of the picture symbols of the church. We're the building of God. Foundation. What are we, what are we choosing to build with? The materials. We've talked about that. We've talked about how Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on a rock. This is a winning place. We're not a perfect place. We're a forgiven place, as Chris mentioned this morning. We are a place where the people seek to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Not because of what any of us have done, but because of what he has done. We abide upon the rock. We win. We win. And also, we are the pillars and the support of the truth of God, and we need to take that seriously as we think about what is to be the nature of God's kingdom.